We left last week with Stalin and Mao cozying up to each other on the back of the Korean War, but by 1956, Stalin had been dead for three years and Nikita Khrushchev was now at the helm. During a closed session of Congress, Khrushchev went to town on his predecessor, criticizing Stalin for his purges, holding up Lenin's testament which warned if Stalin replaced him he'd abuse power, and then finally, Khrushchev denounced Stalin for building a cult of personality around himself. And there was no question as to who else in the communist bloc these criticisms extended to. But unfortunately for Mao, he couldn't divorce himself entirely from the Soviets. After he signed the Treaty of Friendship with Stalin in 1950, Soviet experts helped China to industrialize, and now in their seventh year, these experts were starting to usurp the power of communist cadres. So with Mao unable to stand idle, he opened the door for free speech, saying, let a hundred flowers bloom and let a hundred schools of thought contend. Had Mao really had a change of heart, or was this simply a trap to root out all communist infidels? This is the story of how Mao's China plunged into unimaginable chaos, but then rose to unthinkable power. Okay, so today is all about the 100 Flowers campaign, and by the end of the video, I want you to give me your verdict. Was this a genuine idea that went wrong, or was this a trap to expose dissidents? And so, like I said, the 100 Flowers campaign was basically a green light for free speech, crucially moving Mao's public image away from that of Stalin's. And this opportunity for criticism was really taken by everyone. I am going to sit right over chair, and uh, whoever wants to come up and roast me, you may. Okay. In Henan, the Communist Party's base city during the Civil War, the People's Daily, which was a newspaper run by the CCP, announced that they would no longer parrot the party. Zhou Enlai, a guy in Mao's innermost circle, said that China could benefit from confronting its mistakes like the Soviets had, and from this point, the criticisms came pouring in. Firstly, Zhou and another key party member, Chen Yun, said that the party needed to apply the brakes on the revolution. For them, spending had increased too fast. The focus on increased output saw a decline in quality and a rise in accidents, and then finally, the heavy machinery being used on wet patty ovals kept sinking. Not only that, but flooding in Manchuria affected 14 million people, and cotton production had fallen by 40%. When Chen and Joe went to publish their article on the need to apply the brakes, Mao said that he wouldn't read it. Secondly, the Chinese public started to have their horizons broadened beyond the Communist Party. Mao's number two, Lu Xiaoqi, said that it was necessary to protect the lawful rights of counter-revolutionaries, and the People's Daily went from six to eight pages, and it announced that it would cover both socialist and capitalist worlds. With this, industrial action increased. In 1956, Shanghai saw 86 strikes, and in Guangzhou, half the dockers stopped work to protest at a new shift system that reduced their pay. Finally, Mao's rule itself was directly challenged. Are you threatening me, Master Jedi? The Senate will decide your fate. I am the Senate. Not yet. So essentially in September 1956, China held its 8th National Party Congress, and it's fair to say that the session of Congress went poorly for Mao. The leader of the army, Peng Dehuai, affirmed that China was governed by a collective leadership as opposed to any individual. Not only that, but Liu Xiaoqi approved a motion to omit any reference to Mao Zedong thought at the session, and there was even talk of relegating Mao to a simply honorary role. Not to mention that the Guangming Daily questioned the idea of one-party rule. Now, there were some minor victories for Mao in this party session. For instance, when Peng challenged Mao's suggestion that spending be focused on industry rather than the military, the party struck down the challenge. Afterwards, Peng was relegated in the party pecking order from 11th to 14th, perhaps being blamed for the death of Mao's son, Mao Anying, in the Korean War. But despite the small victory of keeping Peng Dehuai at bay, Mao's reputation had been too badly dragged through the mud, and the chairman withdrew from public life for three months, having to bide his time until he could strike back. Okay, so Mao backflipping on the 100 Flowers campaign should have been a huge loss of face. How weak of a leader would he look to invite criticism to then just reject it? Uh, can I make just a little announcement? In a professional roast, usually the roaster will say something nice about the roastee after they're done, something about how much they love them. So just keep that in mind. Well, Mao completely reframed the issue. According to Mao, writers were using the 100 Flowers campaign as a chance to overthrow the Communist Party and restore a bourgeois dictatorship. And so Mao flung hard in the other direction, now suppressing any criticism of the government. 
Deng Xiaoping was given the job of leading the anti-rightist campaign to quote unquote squeeze pus out of the abscess. And the crackdown was brutal. In 1958, 43% of criminal cases involved counter-revolutionary activity, with Mao saying there were about 50 to 60,000 arrests in that year. Not only that, but re-education through manual labour was invoked, and police were given the powers to intern people without trial. Of those tens of thousands of arrests, I'm going to bring your attention to Dai Huang, a journalist for a media company called Xinhua. Having criticised the rural cadres for their lavish lifestyles, Dai was denounced on big wall posters, one of which was written by his wife. So Dai was dismissed, thrown out of the CCP, and sentenced to the Gulag. And it probably goes without saying that his wife divorced him too. According to Dai, a 17 year old woman was in the Gulag for saying that American shoe polish was good, but given that the Gulags didn't involve a trial process, we don't have the records to prove that. Apparently in 1958, the conditions weren't too bad, and by not too bad, we're still talking about a 4am wake up and manual labour until evening, but over time these conditions worsened, with food rations reduced to a small bread roll for breakfast and for dinner, with prisoners eating rats to supplement this. Many died from starvation, and indeed due to the cold weather too, and diet dropped from 98 kilos to 41 kilos over the span of just two years. As grim as it was, this was what Lu Xiaoqi said to the Indian government. No matter whether the party's line is correct or mistaken, the party must safeguard its unity. As all this was happening, America still refused to recognise Mao's PRC as a legitimate China, with Secretary of State John Foster Dulles saying communism was just passing on the mainland. In November of 1957, Mao visited the Soviet Union, and though the meeting saw no disagreement with the Kremlin, Mao returned home intent on following his own path of permanent revolution, rather than submitting to Moscow. And so this sets the stage for one of the greatest tragedies in human history. Mao was in desperate need of a PR victory, and was keen to do something that would usurp the Soviets, but unfortunately, this would lead China into the infamous Great Leap Forward. Thanks for watching. You can't miss next week as we look at how Mao's plan to plunge China into modernity results in 30 million dead. Don't forget to let me know below as to whether you think the 100 Flowers campaign was a genuine plan gone wrong or a trap to weed out the dissidents. We can't wait to see you next time for our next venture into a fascinating part of history. By the way guys, we're finally on Patreon, so click the link to head on over to check out a whole bunch of benefits that you can have by investing in the channel. We're talking about seeing my face, having personally commissioned art, and even you getting to choose the topic of the video. Not only that, but your funding will go a long way to helping us get our next goal, which is having the official Chinese history podcast with a real sound engineer. Thanks guys, you're all legends.